afternoon. So we are, um, this is, I think, the last session of workshops uh, or, or closed session, after which there will be a public lecture. And um, it is going to be a different format. Um, first of all, um, the subject is such that we thought collectively, um, my panelists and myself, that it would be nice to have a free-flowing conversation on the theme of safe spaces in the context of university. Uh, so it will be hopefully a more dynamic um, uh, than had it been a presentation style. Uh, so we continue the conversation on the critical importance of an enabling environment for plural and open engagement of all citizens and the civil society with the democratic processes. Um, however, we are not going to talk about the state. For the last session, we are moving our focus to universities. Uh, historically, universities have worked closely with civil society to transform social, cultural, and political institutions. Uh, you know, name any political movement, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, university was part and parcel of civil society, solidarity in Poland, university actors were very involved. Um, so university is a, a, has been a traditional partner of civil society. Uh, universities educate and shape the ideas of future generation of leaders, policy makers, and societal members. And universities are known to be incubators of ideas, innovation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think all of you in this room have been following uh, the discourse and movement um, related to safe space, safe spaces in the context of universities, particularly, I think, Anglo-American universities, uh, UK, US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. It is less of a phenomenon uh, on the continent of Europe or in, in Asian campuses, but maybe uh, it, it will happen sooner or later. Uh, so the focus of this discussion is university safe spaces movement and look at whether the demand for movement and the movement demand and the movement for safer spaces is creating an enabling environment for traditionally marginalized groups to participate in shaping universities future of universities to respond to emerging challenges of increasingly diversified societies like canada um, the proponents of safer spaces argue that this may, this will make university a more inclusive space. Traditionally, uh, historically, there have been marginalized groups who, who couldn't participate, um, particularly in the context of elite universities. So we are at McGill, and I'm grateful that all of you came to McGill uh, to uh, have such a wonderful day with us. And I hope this last panel, last session, will help us think about this critical issue, which is certainly, as, as a teacher, uh, as students, there are many who are students and former students are thinking about. So I'm going to quote Celine Cooper uh, before I introduce everyone. She has written a piece in the Gazette. Uh, she is a columnist in the Gazette. And her piece, I'm quoting, at their best, universities exist to generate and circulate knowledge information and ideas to serve as engines of social, cultural, and economic development, innovation, entrepreneurship, and prosperity. But there are other questions that flow from this. Who gets to decide what knowledge is? Who gets to legitimize knowledge, that knowledge? This is why I also think that the role of a university is, or should be, any way to connect with the real world and with the material realities of people's lives. Those realities are not always pretty or comfortable. God knows they are not always safe, and this is the challenge. In many ways, it seems so simple. Safe spaces are one, where basic decency and respect hold, hold sway, where people can share their ideas and experiences without fear or discrimination. So this is a... a, a a quote from Celine's piece in the Gazette. The whole piece is available online, those of you who'd like to read. 
So around the table, we have a group of very interesting individuals. And I'm saying that, I don't know, average, they brought the average age of the room down. We have <laughs> half of them who are either students or young graduate, uh, graduates of the faculty. So um, I will start from my right. So Nazanpal Jaspal, um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction. Uh, she is a third year law student at the faculty and she has co-founded and served as the co-president of the Women of Color Collective and has thought a great deal about this issue uh, with the collective and with other student groups. Um, then we have uh, Jean-Cyl Bouillet who is a graduate of the faculty, graduate two years ago, but he knows everyone in the faculty because I noticed that every student who is currently in the faculty knows Jean-Cyl. He is the executive director of AIDS Community Care Montreal and sits on the board of directors of the Conseil Quebecois LGBT and is a founding member of the Trans Legal Clinic. So these brief introductions will give you an idea of the perspectives our panelists will bring to um, some of the questions. Then we have uh, Sydney, Sydney Warshaw, who graduated not long ago uh, from the faculty. And according to her bio, which she has penned down, she is an activist and a recent graduate of McGill University. Her interests include intellectual property, video games, gender equality and girls empowerment and food law as well as any way she can combine all of those. <laughs> so that's um, uh, Sydney for you. Uh, professor Shaheen Sharif is a professor at the Faculty of Education uh, at Fitnagin University. Uh, and she, um, Department of Integrated Studies at the Faculty of Education. And she's the director of Define the Line project. And Define the Line is a seven year large partnership grant involving multiple universities, civil society actors, artists, to address the issue of sexual assault on campus and universities' response to it in terms of policies and safeguards. So, and Shaheen is also very well known for her work on cyberbullying um, and has written a lot and recognized an ex as an expert in this area. Then I have Celine um, next to uh, Shaheen. I just quoted her, so I'll introduce you, uh, Celine. She's a columnist for the Gazette in Montreal. For over 15 years, she's worked at the intersection of scholarship, journalism, and public policy, and she's also pursuing a doctorate in education. So Celine brings, will bring those perspectives. And last but not least, James Turk, is a distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson University and director of Ryerson's Center for Free Expression. So I have um, introduced you this, and my name is Nandini Yaman, <laughs> and I'm at the Faculty of Law, Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism, and have been a close friend um, and supporter of Voices since uh, they came they came together. And, um, and I hope to hope that the center will continue this collaboration with voices. So with that, I'll set the rules of the game. And it's very simple. We have a list of questions. And each panelist will respond to that question. You can choose not to respond to that particular question. And the idea is that they won't take more than two or three minutes responding to that question. And following that, I will open um, the, uh, the, the same questions or new questions could be added on the issue of safe spaces. And I hope all of you have looked at the safe spaces background note, uh, concept note, which has been fleshed out many times, gone through many edits, and it's thought provoking. So with that, I'll come to my first question. So the, and these questions have been compiled collaboratively. All the six panelists have contributed to this question. So I'd like to start from Jim asking you, is it possible to have safe spaces in the university while recognizing that the university itself cannot be a safe space? Is safe spaces discourse movement 
Is it enabling the university or posing a risk to its role in fostering an inclusive and free environment necessary for the flourishment of democratic institutions and building open society? So that's to you. It's a big question. I'm glad you start with a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, my answer depends on what we mean by safe spaces. Yeah. Um, I understand safe spaces to be spaces where people who are marginalized, minorities, or dissidents can organize and share perspectives without, in a space where they feel where they won't be sidetracked, silenced, silenced, or derided by others. You know, historically, I mean, safe spaces, we call them that, but are not new ideas. I would argue that they've been essential for a very many years in allowing people to build and sustain virtually every movement for social change. You know, in the American Civil Rights Movement, the African American churches were the safe spaces where African American activists could get together and plan how they would go into the public arena and, and make changes. Um, and, you know, that, that's been characteristic, uh, the equivalent of that in the feminist movement, the LGBTQ2. Uh, universities have traditionally recognized this in a variety of ways. You know, they've had spaces where people could get together who share a certain religious beliefs. There's a Newman Center that I passed when I was walking up here, here Hillel. Are examples of that. There are political safe spaces in a sense. There are young Tory clubs and young liberal clubs. Um, there are identity based safe spaces, black student centers, indigenous student centers, women's student centers. Students often create their own safe spaces informally in dorms and getting together in coffee houses. Those are essential to have opportunities for bringing forward ideas into a public space. My, my concerns, and we'll talk about is when you try to turn a public space into a safe space. But we need safe spaces so people can go into the public domain and come back from it and so forth. They're vital, I think, in the university. Um, um, I mean, I, I, I think I don't have a whole, a whole lot to add just yet. The quote that you gave sort of got my thinking. But one of um, what, I, what I sort of, I guess, will add is um, I've been really interested to see how this whole conversation about safe spaces has evolved in the university. So my, my background is in women's studies. I have two degrees. I have an undergraduate and a master's degree in women's studies, both from Canadian universities. And so, and this was in the 90s, where the idea of safe spaces, it was sort of it came out of feminism, this idea of women's centers and women's only spaces. And I think now when we talk about safe spaces in the university, it, it means something um, much different. We're talking about men, men, mental, mentally safe spaces, uh, physical safe spaces, um, this whole conversation about trigger warnings in universities where we're dealing with difficult knowledges. And I, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, it, it's something that, that, that I'm quite um, concerned about, safe spaces in the university, that if we're, if we're getting it right, and I think that, I think we have a lot at stake. Um, so I am sort of uh, buried in, in the throes of the complexities dealing with safe spaces right now as part of my project on sexual violence um, uh, because um, it, 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 it's, it's difficult uh, in terms of uh, what is private. Uh, so, so privacy, uh, as we heard in the, the previous panel, is a large uh, part of safety. It's a large aspect of safety. Um, and trust is another element. Now, what's happening, as may, many of you have seen in the media, is a polarization of notions of safety between um, student survivors of uh, sexual violence and university administrations who are trying to come up with policy, quite often reactive uh, after incidents of sexual violence occur. And this has, over the last few years, eroded into a lack of trust um, and the challenge for universities in, in, in providing safe spaces for reporting, for disclosure of these areas um, has not uh, been addressed uh, effectively by many universities because quite often the concerns are that um, anything that takes place on the physical brick and mortar university campus is the campus context. However, with social media, everything has changed because 
the notion of sexual violence um, has also had to change. Um, harassment, sexual harassment online, uh, non-consensual distribution of intimate images, all of that is part of the university context and the courts have also acknowledged that if there is a nexus to the university. So that creates a lot of complexities. Um, I'll talk about more about this, I think I'm running out of time, but in the next, <laughs> in the next question. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, a lot of really great stuff has been said and I don't have that much more to add, but I guess um, sort of to frame the way that I come at safe spaces is very much in like a, from a formal, like a, a formalized safe space approach. So while there are certainly informal safe spaces that exist, what I'm interested in is when people create safe space policies or explicitly call spaces safe spaces. And I think um, just responding to the fact that whether universities can have safe spaces, I think that the fact that the university is inherently not a safe space is it underlines the importance of creating safe spaces within it because I think that we do we we it, it is it should be recognized that universities are not safe spaces and that um, you know while universities are part of civil society all of the members of the university are part of the university which is part of civil society and we need to facilitate safe spaces within those the, within universities in order for the ideas and the debates that can take place in those safe spaces to then be brought out to the wider university community and then and then civil society at large. Um, the perspective I bring to it is uh, essentially I'm alumni of McGill faculty, but I'm also the alumni of Concordia faculty. Um, and I remember the debate, I think it was about seven years ago, when the Concordia Student Union was proposing safe spaces on campus. Um, and there was an outcry stating that we don't need safe spaces on campus because the whole campus needs to be safe. We need to implement changes in policies that one specific room or one specific floor in the H building, for instance, is not enough. Um, and it's interesting to see the difference in approach and perspective because at McGill, you go to the Brown building, you have like a floor, you have a sign, you have specific rooms, and it, it, there are just varying approaches to it and varying understandings to safe space. Um, when I was uh, here, I was president of Outlaw, and we had discussions with the executive. Should we put signs that say that the faculty or this specific room is a safe space for LGBT populations? Um, and then there was a debate internally, and the, the end of that discussion was, no, because we think that the whole building as a whole it is, the whole university. Um, I think it, <laughs> the stance was more in line with the, the Concordia perspective to it, but it's interesting to see how different universities in the same city approach um, these issues in varying ways. And I know that, for instance, at Concordia, the Women's Caucus was disbanded because they didn't think it was welcoming, welcoming enough for um, trans populations. So then it became the Center for Gender Advocacy. But whereas here at McGill, we kept the Women's Caucus. So the understanding of safe space varies from different environments and who gets left behind as well is important. So, uh, may I just ask you, how, how do you conceive safe space? What it is? Because Celine mentioned that now the the ever-expansive definition mm -hmm. of cyber and mental, you mentioned trigger warning, physical. What, so I'm just asking yeah. you, how, how do you uh, So we've had these discussions. So um, I'm coming from a community perspective. So I work with populations that live with HIV, hepatitis C, um, the epidemic in the 80s. So we have uh, specific subgroups in our membership at AIDS Community Care Montreal that are of a specific age group that bring with them their own uh, prejudices, discriminatory uh, points of view, etc. So we always talk about safe spaces with them and that if ever you feel offended, you should feel safe enough to say that there's something wrong with what's being said, not for it to be an attack. So a space where you're able to voice your opinions, yes, but also voice your concerns and voice whether or not your feelings may or may not be hurt or uh, brushed in a wrong way. Um, but that's very like sitting in a room with a 35 people living with HIV and trying to get them to be on the same page when you have people from marginalized communities that are living with um, HIV and hepatitis C or um, that are gay as well and or that are women from racialized populations. So it's very hard to navigate when you have um, various intersectional identities, but we're going to talk about this later. <laughs> I know that we are. So. <laughs> um, okay, sounds like the last person I don't really have to add, but, um, will be the first person for the next one. Oh, great. <laughs> um, I think in terms of like creating safe spaces within universities, um, for me it's important in terms of what our objective is. So if we want to have a discussion about sexual violence, for example, 
and we want it to be a good nuanced discussion and we have to think critically about who we invite to that table and what we need to do to meet their needs. So uh, a couple years back when uh, another friend of mine and I um, organized a panel on um, sexual assault criminal trials uh, following the Gomashi verdict, it was really important for us to be serious and th think uh, about people who might be re-traumatized by the event, think about who we can, who we want at the event and who we want to make sure is part of the discussion and whose experiences should be centralized in that discussion. So that inevitably means, you know, contacting SACOMs, making sure that there's a person um, right outside the conference room for uh, for people who need to, to be in contact with the person to have that resource to access. And, you know, at the very beginning of the conference, being intentional and just stating from the outset, like, this is a space where, you know, jokes about sexual assault can't happen. This is not that kind of discussion, and it's inevitably going to alienate people. So I think that's um, my perspective on safe space. It's about being inclusive, thinking about what that inclusion ha must entail, and also um, making sure that we're accountable to each other as students when we have discussions about difficult subjects. So the next question is actually it segues nicely with what you've just said, and I will start from this end of the table because I think it is about um, a lot of thinking and um, deliberations going on among students. So um, one um, one phenomenon among many others, or at least one observation, is that there is a silo-like approach or movement going on. People have divided them. So as you said, you know, space for this and safe space for that. And they, there is not a lot of dialogue back and forth going on. And so I think Shaheen mentioned the issue of trust and legitimacy of university uh, as a university management, university administration. But there is a trust factor or lack thereof amongst various student groups as well. So the next question is to um, is conceived with that in mind. To what extent does the process of developing safe spaces, policies, and procedures need to be a collaborative experience? How important are clear and comprehensive policies to, in establishing what I think one of you have said contours of safe spaces? So you may want to start um, uh, the discussion, and we'll go around. Okay. Um... In terms of uh, what extent do we collaborate with other people, I think it again depends on what your objective is and what you're trying to do. So the example that I'll use is the Me Too campaign that happened uh, a couple days ago where survivors were sharing their stories about sexual assault online. Um, and my feed was filled with two different kinds of responses, people who were sharing their um, experiences with sexual assault and then also people who were survivors and being re-traumatized by this campaign that was meant to help them. So, you know, for that campaign, you know, if it's your objective to bring these stories out and help and support survivors of sexual assault, then use trigger warnings. Be real about um, the fact that this is going to re-traumatize some people and take the measures that you need to make sure that these people aren't alienated from the discussion. Um, so I think it's a complicated answer because I think it depends on the context and what you're trying to do. I think that the need for collaboration, if I, I'm going to bring it back to my community experience, is when dealing with policies, whether it's safer space or not, um, with people living in HIV, there's always the JIPA and the NEPA principles. So JIPA principles, early 2000s, greater involvement of people living with HIV. Um, and later on, when they started realizing, okay, we're just adding people, we're tokenizing them, we're adding them to different committees, um, they started to, they created the NEPA principles, which is uh, meaningful involvement or meaningful engagement of people living with HIV. So it's getting the different individuals in the room discussing, but also making sure that it's a meaningful event. Um, and I think that's core also to creating safe spaces. The collaboration is there, it's required, but it's not just, okay, you're gonna be in the room. It has to be, how far are we gonna go with this? How far are we gonna take your lived experiences and integrate them into the decision-making processes and the policy creation? Yeah. Um, so I would actually say like, so again, as I said, that I'm coming at this from like a, academic thinking about formal safe spaces perspective. And so I'm really interested in safe space policies specifically. And the way that I often frame them or think about them is sort of a, a challenge to the status quo and like sort of the pushing of the status quo. So something that we know and, and Nandini mentioned at the beginning of this talk, but that um, so our societies are shaped by 
all of the by the experiences and our institutions are shaped by codes but sorry, our codes and our constitutions are shaped by the experiences of the people that wrote them and for the most part those institutions that we navigate through are created by a hegemonic majority and what safe, safe spaces and safe space policies do is that they take the experiences and the, the lives of the people of historically marginalized people and they create new legal spaces that are based off of those experiences and then might create entirely new kinds of debates and new kinds of conversations and I think that those are really valuable and those are really valuable things to create. Um, and so to me, the idea of collaboration and the collaborative process that goes into creating what the contours of that space is going to look like or what a safe space policy is going to be is incredibly important because that's about uh, it is through that process that you're asking the people whose voices maybe aren't heard in sort of society at large, you're asking them what's important to them and what, what needs to be enshrined in the space that they're going to, that they're going to navigate. So the safe, the safe space debate, um, being inclusive is really important, it's critical. But it may not always be enough because you can have, you can bring um, uh, different uh, uh, organize, student organizations together uh, to inform a sexual violence policy, for example. And, but as it gets developed and goes through all the administrative reiterations, it, those voices may not be heard anymore. So what has happened in many cases is uh, that the very public space of social media, even with the trigger warnings, has, be has become more of a safe space. But how safe is it in terms of being public? Because once uh, someone discloses sexual violence uh, and a sexual violence incident online, then uh, they are no longer uh, protected by the the the, um, the the administrative, the institutional procedures or protections necessarily. Um, it also places uh, alleged perpetrators. Uh, to be uh, judged in in a in a uh, court of public opinion, so you've got to balance. How do you balance that free expression, protection, safety, privacy, and again regulation? So uh, that has become uh, the challenge uh, within uh, the sexual violence uh, debate. So now, for example, uh, in the work that's happening at McGill, we have another ad hoc panel that is bringing in student um, bodies as, as well. We've got student advocacy groups, we've got student union representatives, we've got uh, faculty members, uh, the sexual violence officer, and now we're looking again to see how um, we can improve on an existing policy that had already obtained, uh, had already had people at the table. But at the same time, what keeps happening is just like uh, the this Weinstein, uh, what's the, the hashtag Me Too, the, that has um, impacted a lot of disclosures online. And not only online, some of the disclosures, it, some people have felt, some students have felt uh, safe disclosing um, a perpetrator's name in a public washroom. Um, so that becomes difficult in terms of now how uh, does that person get called out or disciplined by, uh, you know, in a formal way? So again, is that a safe way of disclosing? Is it going to protect students from, uh, from this person in the future? Because now you've, you've overridden um, uh, the, the processes and procedures. But if those processes and procedures are not clear, then you've got this vicious cycle. And we need to find ways to get out of that to provide actual safe spaces where everybody feels safe. You suddenly are concerned about there's a lot at stake here. For yeah. The university. So, uh, okay. So, so there's yeah, it, it, everybody has said things that I'm actually that it's got my mind sort of mm -hmm. going about it. But I think what I'll do is start with this whole um, Harvey Weinstein Me Too, this, this hashtag Me Too that came out after that. After that all these allegations about Harvey Weinstein, which actually isn't the first sort of social media campaign. After the Gomeshi trial, there was the Been Raped Never Reported, which was started by uh, Antonia Zerbesius and, uh, and Sue Montgomery. Um, what it makes me think of is when we're talking about, you know, democratic, healthy, 
spaces for debate and for challenge um, that social media has become a hellhole. Like it's become a very unsafe space, if you want to use it that way, where it used to be a very uh, empowering, democratic, uh, exciting space where people could go. Everybody had access to it. It was uh, a space where voices were being amplified, where communities were being built. And now there's there's been a real erosion, I think, over the last um, couple of years. I, I, I know it's not Trump's fault, but we are living in Trump's Twitter. Like we are, that, that's really where we're at right now in terms of the sort of, you know, public debate and public discourse, which is something I find really worrying. Um, again, because I have a foot in both the media world and the academic world, what I see is this, you know, a, uh, a hollowing out of, of the media landscape, of, of the free press and things like that, which is concerning. So that's a space where we know we're losing, we're losing power because of the, the erosion of media. Social media has become awful. I mean, it's, it's just, it, you, you, we, we're talking about these cyber tribes where you get these, and I mean, there's, there's, there's empirical data that proves it, that everybody's existing in their own cyber tribes and nobody's communicating. And so that's a problem because, so the other thing that's happening on social media that I think is very worrying is this call out culture, which I think is important in the sense that you have to have it to point out problematic behavior and to call people to account. But then what are the implications of that? Or are we just doing it to, to stifle dissent or to stifle opinions that we don't like? And I think that's something that, that we need to be concerned about. And then this brings me to the role, what is the role of the university in this particular global climate? And it is a global climate where we're seeing um, you know, a rise of populism. We're seeing uh, we live in this era of fake news and false facts. And so I think the role of a university as an institution at this moment in time has never been more important, um, which is why, again, when, when I say we need to get it right, we need to be able to, to really think about the investments that we have um, in universities. Because here's another thing, as soon as the media starts to erode, uh, where are people going for real evidence, for real thoughtful debate, for evidence-based kind of you know decision making? It's it, it's got to come out of the universities, and so we need we need to have spaces in universities where people are sometimes uncomfortable and are 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 given the tools to sort of think these things through. But that's where I find it's it's a real challenge because it has to be done in a space where where people feel comfortable and feel empowered and feel respected, but. Um, so I don't have the answer to that, but I but that's that's what I mean when I say when I see all of these other institutions at this particular moment, kind of um, sands are shifting. This matters. This is a really important um, a really important conversation. And there was a speaker in the faculty, and someone asked her a question about uh, bringing engaging with institutional change, and mm -hmm. because institutions are not serving. Bible facts to justice. And she said that yes, I, I welcome you to engage with this institution change, but do it outside 144 characters. So it's the tweet, right? That's what yes. it is. Now it's 280, I guess. Sorry, it's okay. Well, no. <laughs> I don't. So there's, some people, there's, some. there's some people. There's some people. like, the one. Take time to understand the issue, read, write, but more than 144 characters. So, yes. I'm sure you are tweeting. Please do. It's important. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem with going last is there's been so much stuff that's come up. We could talk for hours. Well, I have two minutes. You, um, you asked the question of the role of the university. The role of the university, in my view, is to educate students and advance knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not to take positions on things. It's to create the climate in which people can engage in rigorous, mm -hmm. difficult, critical analysis from all sides and all perspectives. That's the role of the university from my point of view, and <clears throat> that's necessarily uncomfortable. I don't think we actually learn when we're comfortable and all that. We learn when we're put in situations that are uncomfortable. When I was a student, I was suddenly, I'd grown up in a small place and got, went to this elite university, and suddenly all sorts of things that had never been part of my world, I had to deal with, it was difficult. Figuring, I think that's where we learn. Uh, so then the question becomes, well, how can we make that experience? So 
isn't one where racism or sexism or other disable our ability to do that. So we have to accept that this, some measure of discomfort is at the heart of learning. Uh, and I learned all the plumbing I know when my toilet overflowed. I didn't learn it theoretically or when everything was fine. Um, so, I mean, okay. So, you know, I guess, I mean, the other thought that comes to mind, um, like um, Greg Keeley, the battles we fought when I was a student activist were telling the administration to stay the hell out of our lives, not asking them to do things to rescue us. I'm very nervous about that because the administration and universities and institutions have their own interests, which is normal nowadays is protecting their brand, raising more money, all those things. And those have a bearing on how they interpret and implement policies. We want to say, no, we, the community, are going to set the policies. That was the original vision of the university. That's why we talk about collegial governance. It has the notion of the collegium, not that we're congenial, but that we collectively should. And I just worry that a lot of the discussion of trigger warnings and, and safe spaces, which point to an aspiration that hopefully we all share of an environment that can be respectful, that can be civil, where difference is appreciated and recognized and accepted, um, is being framed in terms of getting somehow the university to do that for us or, or something. And I, th I think that's the wrong approach. I think we have to be more radical than that and claim that turf for ourselves. Most of the safe spaces and the examples I gave were not spaces anybody gave them, it's the spaces that people seized or developed themselves. The black churches were developed in the face of horrible racism uh, and violence and so on. They carved out their own spaces and then were used by activists. And I think most of the women's movement has developed, uh, feminism developed by women seizing opportunities and places and creating them for themselves not saying to the state, well, we want a safe space where we can have these discussions. Because I don't, I don't trust the administration of the state to give those things to us. Yep. Okay, Jane. so <laughs> I think that one way that we can reclaim the role of universities as fundamental uh, educators of society is the first thing we have to do is address what uh, that the deeply embedded forms of discrimination um, that are in every aspect of our society, and every, so we, you know, it's in so it's in popular culture, it's in uh, uh, it's in our politics, it's 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 in every aspect of life. So then it becomes a collaborative uh, approach. I think uh, universities have the capacity to take the lead in uh, working with partners from multi sectors in society to bring them into the conversations and create safe spaces of dialogues about these issues. That way, uh, and working with our students, working creatively with our students, those dialogues can then um, do, to have a ripple effect at, in, into greater society. So I'll give you an example of our model. The model that we have for our research project, which is the seven year project, we have uh, three tiers, law, uh, three projects, um, the role of law and uh, law and policy. I'll get back to that one. But the the role of arts and popular culture, and the role of me news media and social media. So the arts and popular culture, we're we're addressing the fact that disclosure is difficult for students. So if we provide them um, with the connections in fine arts or um, theater, uh, and 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 bring in um, evidence based draw on the, the research from evidence-based research as, uh, and, and, and combine that. And for example, we've got 200 art galleries as part of our project. We're going to develop uh, art, uh, art projects for them. We've got theater companies. Similarly, how do, does the news media um, tacitly condone uh, sexual violence? And how can it mobilize? How can we educate journalists um, to better become more sensitive to these issues. So what we're doing is we're bringing all of these um, aspects into the university and working with the public sectors to, to, to put the focus back on education. Yeah, 
I just, I guess I, I just thought um, something that was really interesting you said, James, about um, the idea that students are asking or that there is this sort of um, this request that's being put up, put on at, um, universities to provide safe spaces for students is like a very interesting one because I guess from my perspective, what I'm, what I've been seeing is more that like universities are, I mean, so, so I don't know if everybody read Dean Ellison's letter to the incoming class of the University of Chicago, which was, which this is, so this was last year, uh, so like an entire year ago, um, the Dean sent out a letter to the entire incoming class saying that they would not tolerate safe spaces on campus. And I think that that's like, to me, that's the crisis of space, safe spaces that we're seeing is not so, is not, I mean, yes, there is a conversation that's happening about whether we're, there's an over proliferation of safe spaces or an over proliferation of call out culture. And that's, that's, that's an, that is a conversation that we're having right now and it's an inter interesting one to have, but I think that it's a mistake to, to ignore the fact that you also see this really huge problem of um, people in positions of power, people in, in, especially in academic positions of power, so that, like the professor of the University of Toronto that will not um, refer to his students by the, their chosen gender, um, who think, who see uh, safe spaces as an affront on the university that they've always had and are suddenly using safe spaces as, as it's a bad word. And I think that that's, that's really problematic. And I mean, the other thing you talked about is like, you know, you don't, you, you learn about plumbing when the toilet is overflowing, not when things are fine, but I guess you also talked about, the, about black churches and those as being really important places, those being important safe spaces. And I think what we're seeing right now in all of society is the toilet is always overflowing. Like the toilet has been up for forever. Um, it's it got the worse than Trump got elected. <laughs> but the, the toilet has been over. But but for actually, but for historically marginalized communities, the toilet's always overflowing. And yep. in fact, safe spaces are explicitly the toilet is overflowing. We are going to go out and get the manual and find ways to solve this this plumbing problem that we have right now. What I'm saying, all I was saying with regard yeah. to black churches is. The black community created its own safe space. Right, and I, I do, yeah. And, and that's the only space that's really safe. And I do think that a lot of safe spaces that are being created on campus are um, being created by the communities yeah. that are looking for them. Right. And, it's, and, and if you're asking for an administration to respect a safe space that's that right. you're creating, that's different from asking an administration to make the I entire agree more. Yeah, I'm I sure, yeah. Uh, just, I'm sorry, just, uh, you referred to this letter that, uh, is it the promise to a vice president or whatever? Dean you, Ellison. Uh, Dean, it was uh, Dean Ellison, uh, Ellison. Yeah. Uh, Anyways, yeah. his name is Ellison. Yeah. The back story to that is it was purely hypocritical. In fact, <laughs> University of Chicago has safe, <laughs> has safe spaces, prides itself on having safe spaces. That letter was written to appeal to right-wing alumni to get them to give money to the university by seeming like this tough guy who was telling students to get lost. But the culture there was, that it created but on still, the, on so. No, I'm just saying, so yeah, there, there was just a lot. And, have written the, now they have modeled many, there are 16 US universities who followed the same template. And no, I don't think that's true. Yeah, there, are, there are a number of universities, you can look at Princeton, you can look at Yale, that have statements that are not like his at all. No, but the pen, I will not iterate, but there's a report, the Penn uh, report on university inclusion, diversity, and freedom of speech in university U.S. campuses gets some data on, and it's, I got that report through. Most some, universities were horrified by his aggressive attack on students in safe spaces in the simplest right. sense. Right. Right. So, um, I think there is, a, I think we've heard many things, first of all. Metaphors, no more toilets. <laughs> uh, I know it's the last panel, but something else. Okay, so we are done with that. One. Um, I think there is so. Uh, faculty of law is a very good example. I think Pearl is a graduate of the faculty, and she could tell you what faculty was when she was a student here, and what it is now. Institutionally, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, in terms of faculty, in terms of gender balance in faculty, in students, attitudes, etc. It's so unrecognizable. It's it's nobody, nobody. So I, you know, I student. So so you know, real professors were one of those schools, and then I started to be kind to me out here times a week. But but you know, students will say things. To
But it is that matters. It's very different than they were. So So in terms of yeah. Yes, Julia? Uh, not really. <laughs> no. Uh, I, you know, I, uh, soon though, if you let me uh, just go through, and there are not so many questions, and in fact, it's as I said, it's a few points. So it's just a question of trust and legitimacy. So the more I think there is, the student population is very different in, in the university now. People come from, uh, Many, many uh, students who are at the faculty of law um, it certainly cannot identify themselves with some of uh, our institutional practices. Um, and educational institutions are very slow to change. I was just talking about an institutional theory, cultural institutions, traditional ones are the endogenous. They hardly ever, they take very, very long time to change. And then there are different institutions and it, universities change slowly. It's, it's, it's a process of change is slow, but cha they change never, nevertheless. And I think you can see those of you who were here 20 years ago. And so with that, the question of trust and legitimacy, Shane says that policies and processes students don't trust so much. So my question is, and from Naz, how do we build trust and, uh, in institutions and en enhance their legitimacy? Particularly when the community is getting highly diversified and they're competing agendas. So we are in a public funded university. And I think um, I was very happy to have Ravi's voice this morning uh, from disability perspective. Because a perspective which finally in the university, I think Ravi's point was that you cannot talk about disability as separately. It has all, whatever we do, advocacy, activism, no matter where, disability has to be built in accessibility, inclusion of people with disabilities. And that's a perspective which is fairly new in, in university, but nevertheless, it's on the agenda. And that means it requires resources. Everything requires resources, right? So, so it is a public funded university and or, or we are looking for money from donors and then we are trying to do things which we, many of us are not happy about. So with that, how do you build as the more diversified we get, the more different, they need not be comp competing, but it's okay, competition is healthy. We may have our different agendas. How do you build that trust in an institution, which was fine as long as we were fairly homogenous, but that's not, in fact, the you, you know it from nation states, that the more homogenous a society is, the social trust is higher, the more diversified one gets, and therefore, that trust goes low, and there's a lot of data on that from an economic perspective, right? Therefore, everyone gives lovely example of trust between citizens and state in Scandinavia. But it's, it's an easy example to give, but that's not the case where you have highly diverse population and not this ethnocultural diversity, economic, and various other. So with that, how do you, what would you do constructively as alumni, a student, as professor, as, as a writer, academic, to, to do that, to, to shape and strengthen our institutions and make them more transparent and inclusive than trust. I'm not sure if I have like the tangible answer to your question. Oh, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I think I'm just going to speak um, from the perspective of starting the Women of Color Collective, why um, that came about. So in my first year, a friend of mine and I started the Women of Color Collective because we felt like our voices weren't being heard, that we were um, uh, being hurt in certain discussions happening in our classrooms and sometimes jokes made by our classmates. So we wanted to create this collective as a space for racialized students on campus to come together, um, support each other, create events where we could talk about issues that affect us. Um, and our community. So for example, we had a conference on um, uh, identity papers for trans women of color migrants in Quebec. Um, so I think speaking of like a, as a person of color at the faculty, and I certainly don't represent every person of color, um, but like I think there's like a distrust in the institution because we have to do a lot of the work that we feel like the institution should be doing. The work, we feel like the responsibility is constantly put on us as students of color and as the collective 
to push certain uh, issues forward, um, bring it to the attention of the dean, um, advocate for students. Um, and I think in terms of building legitimacy and trust in the institution, the institution needs to take our concerns seriously and um, show us through tangible measures, um, whether it's you know increasing the diversity quota or like changing how we do an admissions process so that we aren't um, aren't uh, uh, I didn't think of a word for uh, weeding out students who could be really good candidates at the faculty, but um, for whatever reason might not make it through um, through the um, the admissions process. So like I think. We take the initiative. I think it's often students that take the initiative to create these spaces for us, and the university just has to listen and support us. Um, I think what's really important in this in this situation where we want to foster um, and build trust is fostering a culture of calling, not calling out, but calling in. So it's it's the basis of like anti oppressive principles in community work is essentially we don't call people out. We don't say that's a bad thing. We did that wrong. We call them in. We basically say. Why did you say this? Why did you approach the situation with this perspective? Because it uh, forces an individual um, that's in a compromising situation to explain where that viewpoint is coming from, what values that it expresses and that it uh, produces. Um, so I think that the first step is a culture of calling in. Um, and what I, so I was an ambassador of the faculty the few years that I was here. Um, and I was responsible for giving the tours to students in the summer because I worked at the career development office. It was linked to admissions every time. No one would say yes to the tours, and I was like, I'm sitting at my desk. I'll go give the tour. Um, it was fun. Um, it was really interesting because I had maybe six back-to-back -back tours of students of mar marginalized populations, whether it be sexual orientation, whether it be um, uh, POC or whatnot. It was never on purpose. It was just like they fit, fit with my work schedule. Um, and they would ask overtly, the first question would always be, how inclusive is the university? How is it to people of color? How is it to LGBT populations? Um, I would, the way I would show it to them, I would first go into the room on the second floor that has that image of that, that one um, black man, and then in the room it's just a photo of maybe 30 white men. And I was like, look, this is one example. I just would show space. We would cross the hall, the smallest room in the faculty that's basically dedicated to women, and I was like, this is the room dedicated to women. Look at the size. And then we would just start a discussion and say, and I would always say, well, we're in an environment where we can talk about these issues. So why, why is this happening? Why is this going on? And I thought that was a lot better than being like, oh, they did this and this is wrong. It's we're talking about these issues. We're seeing how can we have more uh, people of color representation in these spaces. There's just so much behind that. There's a lot of history and stories when we try to get the images. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. But um, it's interesting to see as well in like higher up in the administration level, the thought process in terms of how to represent the university. Um, just working with the faculty, seeing behind the scenes, a lot of things would surprise me in terms of decision making. Um, what's the ratio of uh, white students that we're gonna show in this video? Or what's the ratio of interesting discussions? And that's why I always go back to meaningful involvement of communities that do feel like their voices aren't heard and they feel invisible. Um, so it's not just greater enrollment. You can't just say, oh, we have a committee, or this video campaign is going to have three students of color that are going to speak. How are they deciding in the decision-making process? Like, is it a meaningful involvement? And I think that's important. So it's a mix of meaningful involvement and just culture of calling in rather than calling out. Okay, so we'll go quickly now, yeah. and so uh, we can uh, open, because I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> are ready to yeah. their thoughts. Um, I guess, to me, uh, the way that I see fostering University being able to foster sort of safe spaces or spaces that are better for more students is I'm um, sort of in reference to two things that John also said. So first, there's the calling and culture, which I think is a super powerful um, notion and something that is is easy to apply because it's so simple. It's and it's such a simple counter to the fear of call out culture. And another big thing is um, we talked before your answer to the first question, which was about um, safe spaces in in a community context as being a place where maybe somebody might say something that makes you uncomfortable, but you are feel comfortable to be able to say, that made me feel uncomfortable. And it's about creating a space where people respect each other enough and, and are told to respect or like know to respect each other enough that they are able to have conversations. And I think that that's, to me, that's what the university needs to be able to do and what the university needs to be able to foster. And it also, and, and that respect means recognizing 
that sometimes the university is going to make mistakes and they need to apologize and sometimes people are going to accuse them of doing something that made them uncomfortable and instead of the university saying like I mean, I'm not like, oh God, we didn't do, we didn't mean it, or like, we, that's not true, or like, you're just, you're just making us uncomfortable. It's like understanding that students are, have, it, have different experiences, and then something that might make one person uncomfortable might be something that has never crossed anybody else's mind, and like, taking that student, or taking that person's experience, and like, taking it, that experience and believing it, and being open, and thinking about um, how things can change, or how you can actually just listen to that experience instead of just assuming that it's part of sort of this, again, this proliferation of, 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 of limits on people's speech or on their people's expression. Any thoughts from you? Mm -hmm. Just a few. Um, I think we have to address the intersectionalities in every aspect of the university curriculum. We don't have, we don't do that enough. So for example, after the Dalhousie incident uh, happened, we have developed here at McGill uh, social justice uh, courses that are compulsory now in dentistry years uh, three to uh, years two to four, and we need we're working on incorporating all of that. Uh, you, you know, there's a the courts have said there's a legal obligation on universities to ensure that they do not foster deliberately dangerous environments or that they don't foster, don't uh, create poison environments. That they need to provide environments that are uh, free of discrimination and safe and conducive to learning and uh, you know until universities acknowledge that it, it, it is their responsibility to protect students uh, broadly even when issues occur offline and this is where i think i dis disagree with uh, you when it says you know that we can't go to students should not be asking universities to pr protect them it is a legal obligation on universities to do that so um that's where i think it takes time it's going to take years especially from the positions that we're in now. But it's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of communication and dialogue, but bringing in multi, uh, multi-sector, multidisciplinary collaborations, dialogues like this. So I, if I understood Jim correctly, I think legal obligation for physical harm, I think there is a lot in safe spaces, the, the discourse of microaggression right. and, and psychological damage. And I just read something this morning, which I'm not going to uh, cite or quote, but it's, it's talking again. I think someone talked about empirical data. There is no empirical data uh, on microaggression and what it does right. or what it doesn't so, do yes. and how to define to what extent microaggression is. So I think in those, I think that what you're saying is it's pertaining to safety and security of, of those who are in the right. Yeah, right. And that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> There, uh, I, I love everything you've said. It makes me feel so happy that this younger generation is coming out of universities with these really amazing, um, you know, ideas and ways of engaging the university. I hope that the university takes on that obligation and the responsibility instead of having students have to do it for them, particularly, you know, anyway, that's, that's a whole other discussion. But, but I wanted to bring in maybe sort of a different perspective. Um, and then, Dina, you, you had used the idea or the image of, of the nation state, which made me think about, you know, sort of the role of a nation state, which is to build homogeneity, which makes diversity a problem to be managed, which is the way that a lot of institutions, I think, still operate. Um, you asked how we build trust in institutions and enhance their legitimacy. I think this is a really big conversation right now. If we pull the frame back, and again, I hate to bring it back to this, but this whole, what, what we're seeing is the rise of populism. Part of this is, is driven by um, a distrust of the political and economic and intellectual elite who feel, you know, a lot of people feel that they're being not heard or they're being ridiculed. And so there's this, there is this inherent kind of distrust or, um, frustration with this like what people think of as being an intellectual elite whether or not universities I mean we can have a whole conversation about whether universities are actually elite spaces anymore because of all the precarious work that uh, that is and low paid work that how universities function right now but anyway so there's still this idea that universities are elite spaces and that you know there's a distrust of that one of the things you mentioned Jordan Jordan Peterson um, this professor who uh, who uh, re has refused to use uh, the, the preferred gender pronouns. Um, and he was, I think, prevented from speaking 
Was he prevented from speaking or there was a movement? This, this worries me. Um, I don't agree with what he has to say, just as I do not, I find people like Milo Yiannopoulos, who was prevented from speaking at Berkeley, abhorrent. I find people like Ann Coulter, abhorrent. But what worries me is when these people are being prevented from speaking at universities, and I, I see both I see both sides of it, but I also see, or I also sort of think that, you know, light is the best disinfectant. I think we need to be able to have these conversations and they need to, we need, we need to know because it's happening. Um, when people are shut down and prevented from speaking in universities, they still have a major impact. That's what, you know, sort of drove the, the rise of, of Trump and this whole far right thing that's happening right now. And it's happening here in Canada, by the way. So we need to be able to understand it and we need spaces actually like as controversial as it is for the people who help hold those views to have a space in the university as well to understand that. And that's very, I, I mean, I find that very, very difficult, very difficult. But it's it's a conversation I think we need we need to have that um, how how do we make spaces for for things that some of us find like totally abhorrent in universities to you know to dialogue with that to understand what's going on. So As anyway. Carruthers, Charles Carruthers, when writing about civil society, said that civil society is not only civil. It is no, a lot of no, civil no, no, society, no, no. but it is civil society, and so absolutely. Yeah. Having raised a thousand complicated <laughs> issues, uh, just three quick things. One, one of the things that's really difficult um, is I think it's wrong to see free speech and social justice as in fundamental conflict, which is an overlay on much we were discussing, because they're not. It seems to me they're allied in their opposition to orthodoxy and in their commitment to inclusion and participation. What's particularly difficult for those of us talking about free speech is the free speech mantle these days has been picked up by Ann Coulter and Milo Yiannopoulos, yeah. uh, whose commitment is not to the First Amendment or to the Charter, uh, but I guess the way I'd describe it is to the hunger of of trolls eager to feast on the remains of liberalism. Um, so. Um, I think your initial question was the wrong question. That is, how do we build trust in the university as an institution? I'm not sure there's ever been that much trust in the university as an institution. You know, in Canada until about 50 years ago, universities were tiny elite institutions. In the 1950s, the participation rate of students in Canada in universities was less than 5% of students who went. And most of those students went went because that's how you got certified as the next generation of the elite. Um, and that's gradually changing. There's still, I mean, if you looked at the social class background of students in universities today, it's still not representative. It's much better than it was. But I think when I was at CUT, we always took the line that the administration isn't the university. We, the faculty, the students are the university. It's our university. So when I'm resistant to saying, well, we want to get the administration to do this and the administration to do that, we want to control our own institutions, which is not to say that the university as an employer doesn't have an obligation to fill its obligations under the law to have a discrimination, harassment free workplace. We're not asking some favor of them to comply with the law. Uh, but from my point of view, we want the institution or the administration to at the very least get out of the way of us doing the things that the university is for, which is educating students and advancing knowledge. And many of their policies, many of their mania for, for uh, their brand and so on actually gets in the way of education, treats its students as customers rather than understanding that what education is is a relationship uh, where both the faculty member and the student learn together and explore and it goes in different ways than either had anticipated at the beginning and where the advancement of knowledge often means asking questions that donors don't like and so on. Um, so how do we create that kind of institution, which is welcoming and inclusive and radical in that sense? And so I don't think the starting question is how do we build trust in the institution, it's how do we build the institution to be what it should be. Yeah, and I think there are pluralities of view on what it should be. That's right. Because, and, and that is where I think there is a deficit of, for many, uh, there is a deficit of trust and I think I might disagree with you, but yes, we, they were always radical. So another thing someone said in one of the talks, some student asked something, and she said, 
please don't think that you millennial uh, discovered fight for social justice. We've been doing it, and you know, so it's not that you figured this out, that you're fighting the institution and you're fighting the state and fighting the management. That was no, it's so wonderful. The, there is fight. Yes, so there is a fight, but I do think that that the more diversified we get, um, I think uh, institution institutions need to rethink how how you. Um, how you operate. I think your operating system, I think it's like, it is from Microsoft to going to, you know, iOS, it is operating system you need to visit what we are and who we are. But you and I will debate later. Um, uh, what I want to is to open the floor now. I have many questions which I won't ask anymore. Because I think, please, please, uh, please comment or directly engaged with speakers, but just say who you want to speak with. So Madeline first, and then Mary. Yeah. Julia, sorry, I complete, because you forgot too. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, very nice to have So I'm of an older generation, so I'm trying to understand what you guys are saying. In my, you know, with my, my recollection of the university was like I was here when you know, 30 years ago, um, etc. And so I'm still, well, I wanted to ask from the very beginning, and I think I'm going to answer now, but I'm still going to ask why can't the university do this? I'm having trouble with that. Um, and so I suspect where the answer is going to go, but I think, so I'll just say, that's my first question. Why can't the university do this? I, what I hear you guys saying, which I understand my brain, is inclusion. It's a pretty inclusive space that the university has any institution to be. It's striving to be more inclusive, as not require a whole bunch of processes, maybe these groups, pressuring, demanding, that whole dynamic that the objective is to become more inclusive of an increasingly diverse population that inhabits. Um, and if that's accurate, if that's what it's about, I still go back to this question. I think it's the question of why can't the university be in a safe space. Um, is where is the line? And, and I think you touched on that in your last comment. Why are we seemingly putting social justice and freedom of speech as two opposing objectives when they are shouldn't be? But is part of this debate on safe space is trying to determine the line, there has to be a line, right? But you can't, and we've always known that, that you can't, that there's a limit to an individual's freedom of speech when it starts thinking, trafficking, burning, offending, whatever. And, and is that line being defined? I wonder if I'm trying to figure out what you guys are at with this whole thing. Um, so there's that. And one more thought is, I think I'll stop there. I think I have one more thought. Okay, <laughs> so uh, define the line as the name of your project, uh, but I'm sure Sydney had her yeah. hand, and I will let you. Yeah, so Sydney, Matt, and then Sherry. Yeah, okay. okay, cool. Um, so, I mean, no more than two minutes. Can I just add my last yeah. one? Yeah. Because it's related to the line. I mean, I agree that universities should be able to have a safe space, but there's a line between that. I, mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure that you know we're a better society. We're allowing you know, not to speak in public. I mean, also, I'm not sure that again, again it's about the line, but yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So again. Okay. I mean, so I, I, I agree with you that I'm not sure that we want universities to be allowing uh, you know, athletes to speak in them. But I'm not 100 if I can speak to that because it's very complicated. Um, but uh, I guess the thing for me is that uh, just speaking to why universities can't be safe spaces, is for me the value of safe spaces is that they, and I said this before, but is that they sort of challenge and shift the status quo in a sort of concrete and circumscribed space. And so while, um, and what they do is they challenge the status quo according to the different needs and values of the community members that they are representing or that they are trying to represent or trying to speak to. And so while the university arguably is already a safe space by that definition in certain some ways, um, 
I, I worry that when you, that universities are still fun, like ultimately these hegemonic spaces that for the most part are, as, we, as we've already noted, are being um, dominated by people from a certain uh, religious and class and ethnic background. And so we, so as soon as you try to think of the university as that, as that shifting of the status quo, my worry is that you're not getting to the really important and interesting debates that you can have once you shift the status quo even further according to the needs and the values of marginalized communities within that space. So the reason that I think that, so the reason I think that universities can't be safe spaces achieve the really important conversations that could occur once you, st once you open a safe space out into such a wide um, sphere. I, I hear what you're saying, but just comment up very, very yeah, But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to two minute rules. Okay. So, okay. Sorry, guys. Please, no, go ahead. I'll speak really fast. Is that we're defining universities as unsafe. Right. That is where I'm going. Right. Okay. So I, I, I yeah. agree with the need to have these you know, smaller, separate, et cetera, reasons that can go away, come back to the public discourse. I like all of that, and that makes full sense. It's just this idea that the university is unsafe. It's not safe. But I guess the, the wielding of the term unsafe is almost as damaging as the wielding of the term safe. So or it can be almost as like people are for as afraid of the terms unsafe as they are of the term safe. And that the idea that something is unsafe just because it's not safe is not necessary. Can, can just be a practical term. It doesn't have to be like a necessarily bad thing. Not 60 seconds. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So uh, just really quickly, um, I think the reason why universities um, are unsafe spaces is why most spaces aren't safe. Is that we don't live in a in a social vacuum, and that we exist within systemic. Um, the discrimination, the power dynamics that we exist in are like systemically oppressive. Um, so. That's why I was really appreciative that you guys talked to call-in culture because it emphasizes um, the importance of transformative change rather than getting it right on first go. Um, like, even you know, despite all my work with like women of color collective, I'm still I don't exist outside of all these social dynamics. Like, I'm still part of um, anti-blackness. I'm still part of um, heteronormativity. I, I can't escape those systems that you know I exist in. So I think it's constantly being part of this transformative process and calling each other in and acknowledging that this is going to be an imperfect process but we need to make that change happen um there was another part of your question that i totally forget what i wanted to answer um oh yeah oh sorry <laughs> sorry i'm sorry. Uh, sorry really quickly so i think um in terms of where to define the line in my experience, um, implementing a safe space policy at York University with a student cooperative, one of the things, like I found it really interesting that people were very hesitant um, with implementing the policy. And the way I approached it was saying, the things that you can't say in space because of the policy are things that we wouldn't tolerate anyways. For example, racial slurs, um, for exa or like jokes about sexual assault. We acknowledge as a culture that those things um, alienate people, discriminate people, and that's not the kind of discussion that we want to ha be having. So I think being deliberate and intentional about creating safe spaces just brings those principles out to the forefront and makes us really think about those things. So okay. quick, um, Shaheen and Jim, and then I'll come to Madeline, and then perhaps Celine could take that one. So in answer to your question about the, the line, so we, we called our project Define the Line because the lines are word blurred. And uh, one of, I think one of the, the issues is that we have band-aid policies. The policies uh, are more window dressing than actually implemented effectively because they're not consistent and uh, consistently applied. And they do not address the intersecting and interlocking barriers uh, towards marginalization. And that's what we need a concerted effort. And that's why they're conceived that way. You ask why universities can't be safe spaces, the same reason that democratic society can't be a safe space. The diversity of views, the variety and different interests of the people in this room, let alone in the larger society, don't allow themselves not to be conflictual. Um, we have laws in Canada that say, I mean, what we're trying to protect is a, a place, the university, in this case, a society more generally, where, in my view, what democracy is about is per perpetuating public discourse, which means it's not ended by the election of a government or whatever, because then you'd have majoritarian control. 
So you want to keep a space going so that those discordant voices who are unhappy with the status quo can be heard and not shut up. That's, that's what a democracy is. I think that's what a university is. The outer limits of that are necessarily limited. But if you start, so I mean, in, in the, I mean, if you think in Canada with regard to hate speech, in the last hate speech decision, uh, Watcott, which had with respect to what the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code could say, I mean, let me read you three lines. The legislative term hatred or hatred and contempt must be interpreted as being restricted to those extreme manifestations of emotion described by the words detestation and vilification. Expression in the code ridicules, belittles, or otherwise affronts the dignity of. They ruled unconstitutional. They said they don't rise to the level of ardent and extreme feelings cost, constituting hate required to uphold the constitutionality. So, yes, we set broad limits. The university has to set broad limits, but within that, we have to. So, it's not safe or unsafe. I would suggest that we understand the university is necessarily a messy place. We have to tolerate that messiness while still having aspirations for civility and protecting the rights of marginalized people to get together and organize to help shape that messy place, but it's necessarily a contestation. So the thing is, not just, so one of the things which this move has done is marginalized people need not get together alone. They need to get together. I think social change can only, first yeah. To participate in the public. yeah, social change happens when the critical mass of, you know, people thinking and wanting a change an impact on institutions happen. So I think how to generate and one of the fears of the the way safe spaces is being talked about in the university context is once again that it's create it's it's fragmenting the fabric rather than playing on solidarity and you know any movement we have looked at is played on solidarity. So that's what we had talked about with that uh, Madeline and then I have the others. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. So it has to be very brief now. Two minutes max. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder. It seems a lot of conversation framed as positing safe spaces against neutral, intellectual, challenging collegial space, and thus the framing of the opposition. And so I do wonder about where unsafe space fits into a theoretical framework. Um, in particular, to use example of both Washington and Obama, in the thing of uh, some weeks ago, I have a friend who works at Bombardier. They sent me a photo of something that was written by the president of Washington. It said, there is a constant in every respectful moment. This is, I would say, typical, but also an example of something that might veer into the Okay, so we'll take and then um, I'll go around. So who would like to respond to? Would you like to, Shaheen? No, I couldn't hear. So if you couldn't hear. Anyone? Um, I think what's important is meeting people where they're at. Um, we had said it during lunch while we were discussing. Um, harm reduction is at the core of a lot of what community, work, uh, community organizations do. Um, for instance, at ACCM, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have members, for instance, that are from cis, uh, white backgrounds. Yes, they're living with HIV. Yes, they may or may not be um, part of the LGBT community, but they bring baggage with them that might be very conflicting with people living with HIV that are um, migrant women, refugee women, etc. So it's really interesting because we're trying to foster safe spaces, but we also so want to understand where people are at and meet them. So harm reduction in a sexual health perspective is weighing risk and understanding that people know what's best for themselves. Um, and in these respects, you're trying to meet a person where they're at. And what I'm trying to say is 
creating a safe space is allowing the, these people that may not necessarily have the same viewpoints as you to speak as well, but to have the right to say, well, that's not okay and I'm not okay with that. Um, it's, yeah. I don't know if it answers your question, but I'm like, harm reduction, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess I, I guess wonder was it, is your question sort of that like how do you how do you just deal with spaces that are uh, that are concretely unsafe or like how how do you address them from a So I guess, um, I mean, I think that there is a recognition probably among all of us that there are lots of, most spaces are unsafe or, or unsafe or are safe as, say, spaces that might be explicitly unsafe. And I think that at least several of us believe that the, the um, work to make those spaces into to safe spaces or safer spaces or safer spaces by any definition of safer, like where women are constantly in the bathroom, um, would be needs to come from the individuals that are that needs to needs to come from that community itself. So so there needs to be a desire within that community to try to create safe spaces in some way. Um, unfortunately, I mean that's it's 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 it sucks because it means that again the burden is being put on individuals that are experiencing it. But I think that if you want a safe space that speaks to if you want to create a space that is safe in a way that responds to the needs. Of the individuals that are feeling unsafe, you need to be consulting with them in order to create that. So, yeah, since your question is, is the, the broader question of, of how how do we deal with things that are systemic? Yeah. You know, racism, sexism in the society are systemic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can't just there's not a simple solution of saying, well, we get the yeah. administration to pass rules or have yeah. uh, washroom guards or uh, I mean. It's in that sense you're absolutely right. I mean, in, it, we have to take uh, action. So Jordan Peterson refusing to call a student how, is to me such a violation of a proper faculty-student relationship. But that needs to be called out. I'm not calling an administration to fire him, but a lot of us, I have, and others need to just say that's absolutely unacceptable. You know, we have to claim our own turf here, and it's not just the victims of it who have to claim it, the rest of us yes. have to claim it. So, uh, just Kenny had a comment on something which was said a while back, so I want to take that comment and then Yavar and Rushdia and Fayaz, if time permits. Um, and I just wanted to make a comment, uh, which is based on my experience of the tension between uh, public and private spheres in, um, in safe, or partially safe space anyway, which is at the First People's House, I think, where I was in grad school. And um, it's interesting because now it's the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and there's a lot of interest and, and the, uh, growing activism among Indigenous people. There's a lot of and so um, it's interesting because at UPIC, the first people's house is a very obvious safe space. It's, it's its own building and it was deliberately situated in the campus. Um, and we did host a lot of, when I was there, there were a lot of uh, public events um, during which different aspects of the indigenous cultures were shared. And, uh, and I felt that most people who came to visit were respectful. But it's just interesting because sometimes, um, if you're someone who, like me, has spent her whole career trying to advocate for the rights of indigenous people and um, is constantly talking about a lot of those issues and has experienced certain, I guess, uh, difficult uh, things as a result of both being an indigenous person, being an indigenous person, who's not always recognized as an indigenous person. Um, it's sometimes really exhausting, so I really like to go there and just hang out and feel that. Um, I didn't have to explain certain things to certain people. Um, even though, you know, being human beings, sometimes we had our own um, unsafe things that were going on in front of the other clients. But what was interesting was just the idea that um, there was a sense that we had an obligation to, to, 
share with other people mm -hmm. what was going on with us because there is that demand. I'm not saying that's a bad thing because I like I mean to you like sharing with people to each other. But sometimes there's just that sense of pressure that people expect us to constantly have to do. Sure. So that's what I'm Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, one question I have for Sydney. I was wondering if you could speak to the historical context of safe spaces uh, as a radical organizing tool for the women's movement as a means to an end, as opposed to an end in itself, mm -hmm. and the relevance for that to either the, the contemporary debate, applying that. That's one question. A question I have for Nazem Paul. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to um, the, the relevance of having multiple safe spaces, that certain spaces may be defined that may be exclusionary, but safe for some and not safe for others. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I can give you a full historical you know, overview of, of safe spaces. In fact, in my, uh, I, I said I don't, I don't know that I can give you the full historical background in safe spaces within um, the women's movement, but I think Margaret and perhaps Mary might be able to speak to that as well. Sydney I think, has a paper. And, and, and right Sydney here. has a paper. <laughs> so I mean, what, what I, I'll, do, so I'll, just, I'll just say my, my own experience really was sort of rooted in, in coming through women's studies at Queen's University and then at York University in the 90s and sort of early 2000s um, and what, how we conceived of safe spaces, of women's only spaces and the sort of ideas about protecting those spaces that really, um, you know, we, there was, the word intersectional wasn't really used, but there was sort of, there were conversations about race and ability and class and things like this, but I, I think this concept of safe spaces has, um, I've seen it really evolve into something very different from, from you know, when, when I started out at university. So that was, a, that was a Sydney or anybody else who would like to actually talk about sort of that, that idea. Okay. I, I have a quick feed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like it's, okay, so I'm going to read you the first sentence of each of these paragraphs. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, uh, there's a book called Mapping Gay LA, The Intersection of Place and Politics, and in it, the writer, Maura Kelly, um, she actually lo locates the origin of safe spaces in the feminist movement. So I think touch on that um, in the United States in the 60s and 70s, and um, basically, spaces were created where women could come together to form collective strength and generate st strategies for resistance. Uh, and I get, actually something that's interesting that speaks to a lot of people's fears about safe spaces that she quotes um, one of the founders of the early 1970s radical feminist group, New York Radical Women, uh, who said that the purpose of hearing people's feelings and sphere experiences was not therapy. The idea was not to change women, not to make internal changes, except in the sense of knowing more. It was and is the conditions women's fa women face. It's male supremacy we want to change. So, interesting. Um, then, sort of moved to gay communities in New York and LA. Uh, it was actually also really interesting because after that it was, it was um, like, uh, Safe spaces were spaces where people might were like going into we'll go, like gay bars were safe spaces, but in those spaces people um, knew that they could get arrested. So it wasn't about the fact that it was safe, like you couldn't actually be sent to jail, but that um, you were out in good company and could find practical resistance. And so it was a place where, again, like sort of, sort of like um, like a first people's house, where you don't have to necessarily explain your existence in that space. Um, and then it keeps moves. Then then basically it moves into academia. So. I don't know if you want more. No, but, but I I'll, think the question was, it was means to an end. And um, the current discourse seems like an end in itself. And that is the question. So originally, Anyone yeah, so I guess, and then I guess then the move to academia was then it was ne not necessarily as much of a means to an end in the traditional, like fighting for women's rights or fighting for gay rights, but more about um, critiquing uh, notions of space and notions of institute and, and critiquing the way that institutions perpetuate uh, problematic discourses and and sort of it moved into that space. So that's the, yeah. So just to, um, can you just want me to talk about multiple yeah. space space or? Like, I mean, you, you created a, a collective and I'm wondering, based on how you define space, it may be invited to some, it may be exclusionary to others. So the notion of a space, out, sorry. sorry, the notion of a space that's <coughs> inclus inclusive to some, but exclusionary to other, but still safe. Essence. So safe space says plural. Okay. All right. I'm 
I'll do my best. Um, so with the Women of Color Collective, that is a collective that only self-identifying women of color can join. So that is with the idea of, like, for example, like with the First People's House at UVic, it's the idea that we can just come into the space, be ourselves, not have to worry about um, people questioning our racial identity or questioning our realities and, and, and our experiences. Um, and being able to validate and support each other's concerns. Um, but then we hold host events that are open to everyone. And those events are hosted with the, with still those same principles of respecting each other, fostering um, dialogue. And that was similar with the student cooperative at York University, where again, like it's a space that's open to anyone. Um, and we expected students to behave with each other in a respectful way. Um, but then we would have events within that space that were closed to certain populations. Is that? So I think is that I, I, if I understood the other question, so by extension of what you are, we are envisaging many spaces, yeah. separate spaces, inclusive for some and yeah. not inclusive for others for certain purposes. Am I right to understand yeah, I your think question? that's what you said. I just wanted to add a little anecdote from this past summer where, so Canada Pride was held in Montreal this past summer, the very first edition, it was 10 days, and they had decided to create a space for, um, a safe space for black youth, um, and a youth space as well, because they did, you know, for many reasons, um, and sometimes safe spaces are co-opted, right? So these safe spaces were essentially used by police officers, and they would just walk around these spaces to see if black youth were basically either smoking up, taking drugs, or doing things illegal. And in the second day, I think, a uh, black racialized trans youth was arrested for smoking marijuana when everybody walking around in a public park was smoking marijuana. So sometimes space, safe spaces are basically used to target and to, to reproduce stereotypes. And so this was a super unfortunate situation. Black Lives Matter Montreal got involved. It exploded. but. It was so surprising because of the community, because after that day, on the second day, for the next eight days, that space was empty. They were like, we just don't trust it, because now, for some reason, police officers are walking around and targeting us. Um, so it's just a, a comment to, yes, there are multiple safe spaces, and it's amazing, but sometimes you don't know how the environment is going to react to those safe spaces. Sureshdiya, so, you had a question, and speak up, because we are all having, and particularly the panelists must hear you. So come on, come on. Um, it's So, so what I'm saying is 
visage can be envisaged creation of that kind of safer space and thinking of that more as as enabling space or I was thinking more like respecting space but but given the context of the of the context can be called as an enabling space so space that enables everyone to participate whether you are marginalized vulnerable or or you know like no matter what your experience is we are enabling everyone so which also means that there are some who have to step up and you know, like those who have had more more like you know more exposure more experience and all kinds of things more privilege I mean, we're talking about like, you know, is university the elite space or not? Well, uh, you know, it is, it is still elite space. Look, look here, I mean, is there a single black person here? No, it, it speaks to the fact that maybe they're not black. I mean, there are, I know some black lawyers, but they're not here, right? How many people have to in the room? So, I mean, it just speaks right away to the fact that it is still an elite space, right? So, <laughs> so I guess what I'm trying to say is that that there are some who need to step back in order to in order to make room for, for, for those who are not who are not present or who are present or are present but marginalized, you know, are, are, are like just haven't given the space. So I guess so just I'm thinking about like how what you how, how would you react to this this idea of creating this like you know self uh, safe space everywhere or like the idea of enabling space. Anyway, so I'll, I'll start from us and maybe I'll go around again. Yes. I react very well. <laughs> no, I think it's really important and I think part of it, it involves people who are in charge of the space, whether it be um, professors, whether it be facilitators of meetings, leaders of movements, to acknowledge the reality of, of certain dynamics like sexism, like racism, and, and appreciate that those things are, are there and take it upon themselves to make tangible changes in, for example, how we do classroom discussions to make sure that certain voices are elevated. Um, if we have a discussion on uh, like women's rights, for example, uh, you could have an all-male panel, but that probably won't be very good. So it, I think it's incumbent uh, for, on us to be more thoughtful and deliberate about the choices that we make and acknowledge um, existing power dynamics. And to me, it's. Well, for me, it's really obvious, but it's acknowledging the different privileges that we come from, the baggage that we bring to the table. Um, I talk on a radio show once a month, and this sexologist, she, one of her PhD students, wrote about um, a minority discomfort. Walking into a room and feeling uncomfortable because of a certain piece of your identity. So we just started talking, and we're like, well, when I walk into a room, and it's just a bunch of white men, I'll feel that I won't. I won't be able to put words to it, but I'll have this feeling, and I'll just have an assumption that oh, everyone's probably straight, everyone's probably white, everyone's from, probably from a very privileged background. But then you add that to individuals that are from uh, different intersectional minority groups going into a room. It's just bearing in mind that yes, we're living experiences, but if we add the experiences of other people and what they're they've been marginalized with, we just have to make sure that we keep that in mind when we're having discussions and it's a question of Naz said it earlier when we're having lunch like accountability it's making sure that we can have respectful decision discussions be accountable but also acknowledge what we bring to the table and who's not speaking at the table like when you said there's no black individuals you're like i was thinking exactly the same thing the second i sat down and we started sitting like talking and i was like okay what's the proportion of like cis to trans people in this room like who's listening who's talking who's um at this table like I was at a panel for the city of Montreal at a youth group, uh, and they were like, oh, we're talking about youth diversity, inclusion. There was 15 of us. And then the second I started talking, I was like, okay, there are two people of color in a panel of 12, and there are no trans individuals in this room, and you're talking about the future of youth in Montreal. It's like, who's speaking and who's left behind has to be acknowledged. So one minute each. That's cool. Literally um, one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like super into the idea of, the, like, I, I actually like the idea, the the term of enabling space that you described. And I think for me, um, I mean, what really what struck me, and I think that this is the thing that people are the most afraid of about safe spaces, is the idea that you might need, to, might need to tell people that they need to step back from a conversation at a certain point. But I think that that's incredibly important and it is incumbent upon the person that is looking to create the safe space and looking to listen to, and looking at the space and looking at what needs to happen and what conversations have to happen and saying, okay, for the purposes of this conversation or for the purposes of this day or for the purposes of this class, we're going to privilege these voices and that, and for the, the individuals who don't represent those voices to recognize that this isn't because 
nobody wants to hear from them ever in any context or because their opinion isn't valuable, but actually that their opinion is overvalued in every other context and that this is actually just about resetting a balance where, um, where people who aren't being heard in other places are going to finally be heard in this one. And, uh, that's what we're doing. We're trying to develop over the next seven years um, models of creating safe space, these kinds of spaces within classrooms, but they're coming from our students. Our students are engaged and, and uh, participating and giving them agency. They're the ones who are coming up with these spaces and then working with the professors. So hopefully we'll be successful to see. Um, no, just briefly, I don't, I don't have too much to add, but I, but I think um, this idea of enabling, enabling spaces um, in institutions, I think it's incumbent upon institutions to um, provide their classroom instructors or their administration with the tools to do that because it is difficult. Um, I, think it's, I think it's something that, that we all struggle with no matter where we come from is how do you create these enabling spaces and so um, and yeah I mean it's one of the reasons why I like your project so much which I can keep bringing coming back to this but this idea of needing to meet people where they are I think that's so important no matter where you are where you're coming from or what your your role is it's we have to be able to meet people where they are so, um, so. last word your comment was really important but it also points to the problem of using the term space, safe spaces to mean so many different things. Uh, I don't think we can use a physical definition ever to point to a safe space. And the example of that was pointed out that whether there's a safe space at the Pride event, I mean, when it's physical, a safe space by definition has to be a space that the people in the space take control of. It's not a space that exists independently of the people. You can't say, well, this room is going to be a safe space because People coming into the room may not make it a safe space. So I'm not sure we should ever think of safe spaces in a physical sense. And also, an inclusive space is different than a safe space. So it's perfectly desirable on many occasions to ensure those voices that are on, aren't often heard are heard. I don't think that makes it a safe space, but it does make it an inclusive space. And I, I think it confuses them. Because when you make it more inclusive, you may create the circumstances where it's more divisive and uh, and things that are offensive to one can be heard and said, which, I, I mean, a lot of the demand for safe spaces comes from people who say, I shouldn't be in a position where I could be offended. Okay, in fact, some of the reasons that people want to be in a safe space is so they can talk and not have their identity questioned. They don't have to deal with those issues. They can talk about their real issues that they want to talk about. Uh, so an inclusive space may be unsafe in one sense, but it's inclusive. So I think we need to be a little more precise in our language. And I think a safe space is, a, is so going back to where we began, is vital in the university because people who are marginalized minorities, dissidents, whatever, need to have spaces where they can get together and feel that they can have their discussion not corrupted or taken away from them by other voices. Actually, I have literally 30 seconds because the wrap up is there. So 30 seconds and I don't want to cut people off at all. <laughs> yes.
<laughs> so I, I would not say anything in conclusion because it remains in conclusion and it is to be continued. And I just wanted to thank all of our six panelists for taking on a very difficult I'm grateful for your participation, and we, I think, have all uh, have been informed about many things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank Nadini, who really has shepherded this whole project. I think it's great courage. <laughs> <laughs>